We are back with Robert Higgs of the Independent Institute. Robert Higgs, for people just tuning in or if they've been watching you for the last couple hours on In-Depth uh, and they wanted to learn more about you or read one of your books, what would you recommend? Uh, I, I would probably recommend the, uh, the book called Against Leviathan. Uh, uh, in, in a way, uh, <laughs> they would learn more about me because uh, uh, that book uh, was aimed not so much at colleagues in the social sciences as, uh, as is aimed at the general public. And so it's quite accessible, but it's also more free swinging. And, uh, and uh, some of the essays in there are, 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 are quite polemical. Uh, others are mo more scholarly. Uh, but I think sometimes you, you learn more about a, a person from his polemics than you do from his scholarship. What is the Federal Register, and do you read it? <laughs> well, the Federal Register is the government's uh, publication uh, where they, they have to publish uh, every uh, new proposed regulation or change in regulation or uh, final regulation, what have you. So it, uh, it comes out all the time and, and by the end of the year it's an enormous thing just to, to uh, list and describe all, all of these uh, regulations. Do you read it? Oh, I, I have read it. <laughs> no, nobody reads it the way you'd read, it, read a novel. Uh, uh, I've used it in my work. Uh, to go back, particularly when I was uh, working on uh, FDA regulation. I read quite a lot of the Federal Register in those days. You write, already profuse beyond comprehension, the labyrinth grows ever more extensive. In the U.S., at the federal level alone, the four to 5,000 new final rules put in place each year require some 20,000 pages of the Federal Register for their official promulgation. I, I think uh, ordinary people uh, would be amazed and appalled if they were to open up the Federal Register and try to read it. Uh, first of all, they'd discover it's almost incomprehensible uh, because many of these regulations are, are, are quite technical. Uh, for example, the ones uh, relating to the Food and Drug Administration often involve mathematical formulas and and descriptions of various chemicals and chemical reactions. <laughs> and likewise, for other areas of regulation, you'd find all kinds of arcane uh, information there, but you really wouldn't be able to understand quite what they were getting at because so much of it relates to, to revising Section 421-9 of the law of uh, 1977 and so forth. Uh, uh, lawyers are the ones that are uh, have their eyes glued to the Federal Register and, and, and regulators uh, because they're, they're required by law to, to go through the motions of uh, publicizing what they do. Lee Dembart in LA emails, I'm surprised to see C. Wright Mills listed as one of your greatest influences. Mm -hmm. Mills was on the far left. What was his influence on you? Mills actually had uh, several uh, kinds, of, kinds of influence on me. Uh, I uh, was very fond of his writing when I was an undergraduate uh, in college in the, the 1960s and um, he died in the early 1960s so, so uh, this was at the time when, uh, when many people who uh, thought of themselves as new leftists uh, were reading uh, Mill's books and uh, uh, I suppose uh, to the extent that I had any uh, any political interests at that time that would uh, that would lead me to categorize myself in some camp, uh, I, I thought of myself as a kind of new leftist as an undergraduate, and so reading Mills was a very natural thing to do. But uh, but Mills was worth reading uh, because Mills' books uh, were packed with uh, information, uh, and one could learn a lot. Uh, over the years, as uh, my own education has continued, I've, I, I, I've abandoned many of the views that I, I took from Mills, but uh, uh, I've never abandoned my respect for Mills as a scholar with integrity. One of the things that, uh, that Mills wrote was a book called The Sociological Imagination. And th th this was a book <clears throat> which uh, 
in many ways was a critique of how social studies and sociology in particular were being done. And uh, Mills uh, denounced uh, many of the ways that social t scientists were proceeding with their work because he, he thought it was a lot of obfuscation. Uh, and he thought it uh, uh, was tiptoeing around uh, realities of power, uh, particularly institutional power. And uh, he believed these things were so important that, that they should be exposed and explained in plain language. And, and he wrote uh, beautiful passages uh, to, to uh, mock the gobbledygook that sociologists <laughs> used to write uh, about their studies and their findings. And uh, I, I've never quite got away from uh, that lesson that, uh, that Mills taught me, that, that plain writing is, uh, is usually possible in, this, in economics and the other social sciences, that uh, there's no reason to, to resort to obscurantism, whether it's mathematical formalism or any other uh, form of uh, priestly representation. Uh, these are things that close off economists and sociologists from their, their readers outside uh, the monastery. And so uh, I, I believe uh, that Mills had good advice to give to young scholars. He had a lot of good advice, in fact. Uh, but basically it boiled down to, to be honest. Uh, that's a lesson we could, uh, we could all use, even social scientists. Back to your calls for Robert Higgs. Claremont, California, thank you for holding. You're on the air. Uh, Mr. Higgs, uh, I believe that both government and private statistics point to the fact that an ever-increasing percentage of the national wealth is flowing into the hands of fewer and fewer people with the gulf between the haves and the have-nots continuing to widen. If you agree with these statistics, I have three questions for you. What do you think is the cause? If it continues, what will be the eventual consequences? And three, if you had the power to change it, would you and how would you? Okay, let me see if I can uh, recall all the questions. Uh, do I think this is a fact that uh, that a greater and greater proportion of the world's wealth is uh, flowing into the hands of a small group of people? Uh, as I said earlier, it's hard to know. Uh, the data that are uh, used to study this question are are flawed in a variety of ways, and so uh, there are serious questions about what the distribution of the world's income and wealth really is. Uh, it does appear uh, from a variety of data that in the United States uh, the distribution of income has become less equal in the past 20 or 25 years. Uh, now, why has this happened? Uh, I think it ha has a whole variety of causes. Uh, the scholars who've studied uh, the changing distribution of income uh, point to uh, changes in the payoff to higher education, for example, and to, to changes in the makeup of the labor force. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, a great many uh, uh, women came into the paid labor force uh, who had uh, previously not uh, worked there and as a result, they had uh, less labor market experience, uh, less training for specific jobs than the men had. Uh, so they came in, uh, in a sense, uh, nearer the bottom uh, uh, than the men were uh, as a result of their qualifications being different. Now, uh, that, that worked in, uh, in the direction of showing uh, less equal distribution of income as a result. Uh, there have also been major changes in the makeup of households. Uh, many of the discussions of income distribution relate not to individuals but to households. Uh, but uh, we need to remember that a household is not the same. Uh, in fact, when the government developed a, a, a massive payment system uh, for low-income people, uh, many, many uh, unmarried women uh, became clients of this system. Uh, 
Uh, but every time uh, an unmarried woman with a baby uh, goes on welfare, uh, she becomes a household. At the same time, uh, some other household may consist of five or six people, uh, all of them working in the labor market, and perhaps uh, people of high educations and considerable job skills. And yet we're comparing these two households with regard to the income they earn. Uh, it, it, it has the potential for being extremely misleading and uh, uh, to some extent the widening of income disparities in recent decades is uh, spurious. It's uh, an artifact of the way the data are collected and an artifact of uh, flaws in the data themselves. Now that doesn't mean that there hasn't been such a widening. There, there may have been. It just means that there's a considerable uncertainty about uh, uh, how much there's been, uh, when it took place, and why it took place. Uh, th there's a lot of study of this, and it's difficult to summarize all the studies. Now, your third question as to uh, what I would do about this, uh, the short answer is uh, I would do nothing. Uh, these uh, data on the distribution of income uh, fall in the class where I put uh, the kind of data that the world would be better off without. Uh, and uh, the reason is that uh, once these data exist, they, be, they become a, a grist for the mill of the income equalizers who want to use the power of government for this uh, equalization. Uh, I don't want the government undertaking the task of equalizing income. I don't think it's other people's business how much income I have or you have or anybody has. Uh, if I have low income and someone wants to assist me, uh, I may be willing to accept that assistance, but to use the gun, the government's power of coercion and violence to threaten people in order to get income, which is then handed over to other people, even for the purpose of equalizing the distribution of income, I think is extremely dangerous at best. So uh, once we move in that direction, we move, we move toward a system in which government power is the decisive element in shaping every aspect of human life. And we shouldn't go there. Uh, it's taking us toward a house of horrors every time we give the government more power. Government is too dangerous to entrust with the power of deciding who has how much income. Now, a, a, a portion of this widening disparity in incomes may be attributable and probably is attributable to uh, the government's use of its power to give privileges of one sort or another to various people. I've been talking a lot about financial institutions in this program. Certainly, the government has been a good friend of big financial institutions. It's provided a, a, a Federal Reserve System, which is available to uh, come to the aid of uh, banks when they find themselves in trouble. Uh, but uh, the people in the financial industry have often reaped enormous incomes because of their uh, connections with the government. Uh, the, the, not only direct connections, but indirect connections. And so if the government is using its power for the enrichment of people, uh, at the top, uh, that's uh, something I denounce just as much as I denounce any other attempt of the government to equalize incomes. Uh, this is not a legitimate function of government. The people uh, going all the way back to John Locke who've tried to say, why is government a legitimate institution, uh, ha ha have never answered that it it's because we need people with a gun uh, to redistribute income among us. Uh, they've always uh, given more plausible arguments saying that without government, our rights will be violated by criminals. And so we, we surrender our right of self-defense to the state, and in return we look to it to more effectively enforce our, our rights. But uh, we've long since passed beyond Lockean uh, justifications for government, and we now find ourselves not only in this country, but throughout the world in a situation where government brazenly undertakes to say who deserves to have how much. And at the same time, it engages in the fraud of purporting to use its powers for the little guy, to purporting to say we have all of these uh, arrangements and uh, payments and benefits available to help the poor, uh, but not revealing in the same way how much of the government actually works 
to protect the rich and the better off people. North Richland, Texas, please go ahead with your question for Robert Higgs, author and political economist. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I certainly agree with you on the um, industrial military complex, but some of this other stuff I just can't believe that I'm hearing. It's people like you that are the first that are wanting firemen if they've got to fire a policeman and all this is, is um, sponsored or, or financed by the government. Uh, now, if you're saying that our biggest enemy is Congress, I would agree with that. Um, where were the antitrust laws? And the, the lobbyist in the last nine years has tripled to over 3,000 lobbyists. Uh, CEO pay has gone from about 50% of their employees uh, to their workers to over, way over 300%. Um, you know, it, always blaming the workers and the poor just doesn't get it. Uh, what has happened is our fault as citizens for letting this happen and not paying attention. But uh, there has been wrongs, there are wrongs, and it needs to be corrected. Well, I'd like to correct uh, your idea that I'm blaming the poor. Uh, that's almost the exact opposite of what I've been saying. Poor people don't run governments. Never did for long, <laughs> and probably never will. Uh, governments are routinely captured by people who have knowledge, money, connections. They're the people who are best placed to seize government power or to influence the power uh, that is exercised by government, whoever the officials happen to be themselves. So I'm not blaming the poor as such. Uh, the poor are culpable to the extent that they have supported the growth of government power, uh, even though it has been <laughs> uh, contrary to their own interests in uh, a great many ways. Uh, so this, this is not so much a matter of, uh, of blaming the poor or the rich. Uh, my discussions are about what happens when government gets more power. What are the consequences of that? How does it come about? And uh, the, the, the questions that have to do with things like how much the executives of corporations earn relative to the production workers should never ever be subjects of government decision making or lawmaking in the first place. Uh, it's not the government's business how a corporation runs its affairs. These ought to be private entities. If corporations enjoy government privilege, that's another question because no one should receive privileges from government. If government undertakes any action, it ought to follow the rule of law, which is to say it ought to treat every person in the same way. No one should be treated as if that person has rights superior to other persons. So uh, for some reason, uh, when I speak, many people get the impression that somehow I'm here to speak for the rich or I've been accused on this program of being a fascist or upholding a fascist position. Nothing could be further from the truth. If I didn't believe that this growth of government had been harmful to the great mass of people, I wouldn't have carried out my life's work as I have. I believe it's been tremendously harmful to the great mass of people. But the great masses have been brought along with it, acquiescing in it, or even clamoring for more of it, because they've been misled to believe that the government is actually on their side, that they can look to it for their salvation. When they do that, they're looking to a false god. They've been deceived and allowed themselves to be deceived, sometimes almost willfully, thinking, if only I can get my man into power, then all will be well. But somehow it never is. Somehow, when anyone gets into power, he becomes corrupted by that power. Those are the kinds of dangers I'm talking about, the kinds of dangers uh, my work relates to. Dallas, good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Dr. Hedges, in your view, you said government is dangerous or to be denounced. I would like to ask you if in your vast knowledge, if you see any role for government, you know, if you do, can you give three examples? or would you admit to three roles that government plays? 
I can imagine government playing a defensible role. And when we talk about theories of government and economics and political science, we, we talk about using government as a means uh, basically to more effectively protect the rights of individuals, to protect their lives, their liberties, their property. Uh, this is the, the uh, justification for government that goes all the way back to Locke and to some extent even before Locke. So we can imagine that government would be a useful institution. However, when we study history, what we find is that limited government uh, is extremely rare and short-lived. That when we have government, it begins, uh, if it begins small, its natural tendency is, as Jefferson said, uh, to gain ground. And the natural tendency, he also said, is for liberty to lose. That's what we've seen in this country. We had a fairly limited government at the beginning of the United States, especially a limited federal government. Government was more powerful at the state level. Uh, but even there, some of the state government powers were sloughed off over the next 50 or 60 years. So that by the time we got up into the 1840s and 50s in this country, we had something that approximated limited government about as well as any government of a major country ever did. Uh, but it didn't last. And I think we could have seen, if we'd been honest analysts at that time, that there were forces working to break it down, to cause government to grow bigger, more powerful. And in that case, the first thing that happened was the war between the states, in, in which case governments on both sides of the war grew extremely powerful uh, for prosecution of the war. And uh, uh, because of what the Union government had done during the war, lasting precedents were, were created, or, or in some cases, lasting institutions were created during the war uh, that, that saddled the people ever afterwards. Uh, government used its power uh, to give privileges to, to railroad builders. It used its power to enrich those who had uh, uh, cozy connections with the government in power. And, uh, and it built from there. Every time there's a war, we have another uh, move upward on what I call the ratchet of the growth of government. Uh, government gains power during national emergencies. When the emergency passes, some of those powers are surrendered, but not all. So that in each crisis, the government becomes bigger than it otherwise would have been. And, uh, and the lesson here is that However uh, effective, however useful, however valuable we may think government might be uh, conceptually, actual government never works that way for very long. And, and the reason is because government power, if it exists at all, attracts people to seize it and use it for their own purposes. Sometimes their purposes are ideological. Uh, sometimes their purposes are perfectly venal and materialistic. Uh, sometimes their purposes are, are uh, perfectly noble. They want to help uh, their fellow man and uplift the downtrodden. But, uh, but uh, uh, one writer spoke of the, the humanitarian with the guillotine. And that's an image we would do well to recall. Because the government, the agency that controls the guillotine, uh, can be turned to any purpose. And because of the powers it uniquely possesses, it poses a unique danger to everyone. So I, I would simply caution again, uh, we should apply the precautionary principle. When we turn to government, we're seizing a very dangerous instrument. We may think it's in our control. We may think that it's in the hands of good and noble people. But that doesn't ensure it will stay there, and it doesn't ensure that it will continue to be used for the purposes we approve. Robert Higgs was born in Oklahoma in 1944. Why Oklahoma? Why were you there? <laughs> well, uh, my, my uh, family uh, on my father's side had been in Oklahoma for several generations. Uh, my uh, my grandmother, my father's uh, mother, uh, came into Oklahoma in one of the land rushes uh, uh, when she was a, a very small child. Uh, 
So uh, we, we went back quite, quite a long time uh, on his side. My mother uh, had come to Oklahoma as an infant uh, when she was very, very young, and, uh, and her family had lived elsewhere in the north in Michigan. But, uh, uh, but uh, we didn't stay in Oklahoma very long. Uh, my family moved uh, when I was seven years old to California. And I grew up there. In 1950-ish? or 51, we moved. Why did you move? Well, we moved because economic opportunity was uh, more attractive. Uh, wages were higher in California. And uh, my father, uh, who was a very hardworking man, was not uh, earning nearly as much in Oklahoma as he hoped to earn in California. And, and indeed, that's how it turned out. What kind of work did he do? Well, uh, he did uh, a lot of different work. Uh, he... Uh, he worked in the oil fields uh, as a derrick man for some years. Uh, he, he had worked in farming uh, early in his life. His family uh, operated a family farm in Oklahoma. So he, from a very early age, he, he did farm work, and he knew a lot about farming. And later on, after we moved to California, he worked mostly in farming uh, and eventually became one of the uh, managers of a, of a big corporate farm in uh, Central California. Now, you currently live in Louisiana. Why? Yes. Well, I, I live there because uh, my wife is a Louisiana native, and uh, she wants to live in Louisiana. She has a lot of family there, and so I'm there. And uh, what do you do there? Well, I, I, I do all the things that I, I do anywhere, which is uh, to write. Uh, I work with the Independent Institute as the editor of the, uh, the Independent Review, which is a scholarly quarterly, uh, and uh, that occupies much of my time. Uh, but I also uh, work in other ways. I mentioned earlier I, I work as a consultant from time to time. Uh, I've, I've worked with law firms as a consultant and uh, with trade associations and, and with governments, actually. I, I worked with the uh, Washington State government uh, back in the 70s in a uh, fisheries consulting uh, capacity, and uh, I, I, I've uh, done that kind of work later, not in uh, Washington, but uh, in fisheries work uh, related to uh, Alaska. But uh, I, I now write, uh, lecture, uh, for uh, for anybody who makes me an attractive offer, so <laughs> I'm uh, I'm available as time permits uh, to do work that interests me and uh, helps me make a living. Robert Higgs is our guest on In Depth, Buffalo, New York. Hi, Dr. Higgs. I wanted to uh, start out by giving you a personal thanks for an introdu introduction to Austrian economics. Your um, the talk you gave on C-SPAN on Book TV a few years ago for Against Leviathan um, completely changed my life, and um, I found that it has allayed a lot of. You, you spoke to fear earlier. It's allayed a lot of my fear. Um, I've since tried to pass that forward and have it turned a few people on to the ideas. But I'm wondering, what have you found, say, in passing conversation when you have two minutes or less with someone that might not have the attention span to read Murray Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State, um, what have you found is effective in sort of turning people on without being confrontational? And I'd also like to give a hello to your close colleague, Anthony Gregory, who I met and talked in, in, at length with and is an excellent writer as well. Uh, well, thank you for those kind words. I, uh, uh, I, I, I'm almost apprehensive when someone says I've changed his life, <laughs> worried that it may have been for the worse. But uh, at all events, uh, to answer your question, I, I, I don't know that there's any quick way uh, to give people a, a, the kind of appreciation that one gains from a, a, a more concentrated study of uh, Austrian economics. But there are excellent... Uh, books available for beginners. Uh, one that's been used for decades uh, is Henry Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Lesson. And, and that little book has sold millions of copies, and it's still very worthwhile reading now. The examples are dated, uh, but uh, the, the economic logic is as sound now as it was uh, when the book first came out. But there are more recent books that, that are helpful in the, in the same way. Uh, Robert Murphy, uh, has some very good books. In fact, uh, a, a new book of his on the Great Depression uh, 
is just about to be published now, I believe, any day. Uh, and uh, Thomas Woods uh, also has some very good introductory books. David Gordon and Gene Callahan have written good introductory books, all of which can be readily understood by people with no previous background in studying economics. So uh, I recommend all of these, the, these sources uh, quite highly. Bakersfield, California. Uh, hello, Mr. Hicks. Uh, well, my wife actually hailed from Oklahoma, <laughs> so it was interesting to hear that you, you live there. And we live in the Central Valley here now. But I'm curious, um, you know, I've been a libertarian for about 25 years, so I, I won't take issue with most of what you say. But I wonder when you say that, that it's essentially theft to take from one through taxation to give to another on an individual level, um, how do you feel about, or as another caller had asked, about the proper role of government when, when they tax or essentially steal from everyone to provide for the common good? What do you consider is the proper role of government? And taking your argument to the extreme as far as um, uh, Social Security and whatnot, aren't, don't we essentially have to be willing to let people die in the streets if they do not handle their finances properly? For example, if they opted out of Social Security or... or or whatnot? Uh, we need to remember that all the money that goes into Social Security comes from us. And if it comes from us and we're never taken by the government, then it would be in our possession for the relief of the destitute. And furthermore, it wouldn't have been diminished by passing through the bureaucracy to support the Social Security Administration. It's a leaky bucket whenever we transfer income through government because the the transfer uh, personnel themselves eat up resources along the way. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, the government doles out the money according to bureaucratic rules, uh, kind of one-size-fits-all type rules, which means that the assistance can never be tailored uh, so that it goes to those who, who truly are most deserving and does not go to those who are ba basically uh, gaming the, the system at our expense. So there's a lot to be said for, for never taking the money away from people in the first place. And when I say that, uh, I certainly uh, mean to uh, suggest that, no, I don't think people would be dying in the streets if we'd never had Social Security. Before we had Social Security, people were not dying in the streets for want of assistance. Uh, it's true that uh, the society was much poorer but that wasn't because it lacked Social Security. It was because uh, if we go back far enough in history, uh, the economy was not as productive as it is now. So uh, poverty was almost a necessity given the lack of productivity historically. But uh, there was no lack of uh, people's assistance and help. I mentioned earlier all the fraternal organizations, thousands and thousands of them that existed in this country and other countries before government took over the social ins insurance uh, systems. Uh, th there were countless churches, countless neighbors, countless friends, countless relatives. These were sources of assistance to people in need. Furthermore, they were, they were people who knew the persons they were assisting. They could, they could tailor the assistance so that they gave what was most needed, when it was most needed, and they gave moral support. What you get now, you deal with a bureaucrat uh, in a welfare office. This is one of the most demeaning experiences anyone can have. You're forced to go in and beg for your livelihood from somebody who's just holding down a job watching the clock to go home at 5 o'clock. It's far superior to have a system in which the destitute are aided by those who are close to them rather than relying on losing money by filtering it through government middlemen and then relying on uh, one-size-fits-all rules, exploitable rules, corruptible rules, rules subject to the vagaries of politics, uh, rather than relying on that very imperfect means, uh, people have the capacity to develop through charitable uh, organizations, and to some extent they have anyhow, uh, measures to relieve uh, distress and to help people in ways that are really uh, effective and useful and most of all that uh, give people help in a way that uh, if they can be removed from that situation they are removed they're not simply made dependent 
to stay forever on the government dole because it creates a kind of electorate for politicians that support that system. About 15 minutes left with our guest here on In-Depth, Robert Higgs, Middletown, New Jersey. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Higgs. Having grown up uh, under totalitarian communism in Eastern Europe, I can't help but uh, agree with many of your opinions. However, however, uh, at this point in time, as you said earlier, in order to be realistic, governments aren't going anywhere. If anything, they are becoming globalized. There's global mechanisms to address global issues. So uh, taxation is not going anywhere. Uh, wouldn't you agree that uh, a more efficient use of our energies would be to improve the government, to make the government work better for most of the people, to uh, uh, control the financing uh, disaster that's happening in Washington on a daily basis, uh, to take the profit motive out of many of our uh, common uh, uh, endeavors, such as health, health care, for instance, where it doesn't belong, just like it doesn't belong in uh, police or fire departments. Caller, where did you grow up? Uh, in uh, Romania, in Bucharest, Romania. Thank you. Let's get uh, an... In let... the other side, and I agree with most of the criticism, but... Uh, there is a role for government, no question. Instead of talking about lesser government, let's talk about better government, how to improve the government. Thank you, caller. Uh, that's always the hope. That's the hope uh, that springs eternal. That uh, the problem is not that we have government involvement. Uh, the problem is how government is involved. And what we need is to make government uh, more effective, uh, to reduce waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing is when we study the growth of government, what we find is waste, fraud, and abuse only grow as government grows. The more power government has, the more waste, fraud, and abuse almost invariably go along with that growth. Uh, of course, if we have to be stuck with government, we'd, we would prefer a government that was less wasteful, that was more humane, a government that did not... Uh, dole out privileges to the rich, a government that did not prop up corporations that ought to be closed down. Uh, but as the caller said, what we're seeing instead is an internationalization of government power. In the past, there's been some protection for people because they could run away from government abuse, as I presume the caller ran away from Romania at one time, a horrible government. Uh, many people attempted to escape from communist regimes. People attempt now to escape from Cuba. Uh, they, uh, they attempt to escape whenever they're subject to these tyrannical governments. But fortunately for them, in the past, there has been some place to which they could escape. But what we're seeing now is that harmonization, a sweet-sounding uh, movement uh, of government cooperation, is in effect producing cartels of government that are worldwide. Governments are, are trying to shut down so-called tax havens. That is, uh, shut down places where people can go to escape being robbed by overbearing governments. Uh, governments want to make sure that no one can get beyond their reach. And the U.S. government even uh, enforces tax obligations on people who renounce their citizenship and leave the country. Uh, they track them down to the ends of the earth and try to extract money from them. So governments are increasingly uh, cartelizing among themselves, harmonizing their regulations, and every time regulations are harmonized, they don't simply all move to about the middle point in the regulatory spectrum. They, they bring everybody up to the severest form of regulation. Uh, you see this in the uh, European Union uh, in, in egregious forms. Uh, regulations in the EU are in many cases even more horrifying than regulations in the United States because the EU, in effect, it has harmonized regulations across all its member countries or is in the process of doing so. We need to have international competition in a world with governments so that people will have a refuge People will have a place to go. This is the lesson of what we call in this country federalism. We once had much more powerful state governments in this country relative to the federal government.
And the virtue of a uh, federal system is that it gives people a place to run to, to go away from the more overbearing, uh, high taxing, uh, outrageously regulating governments. And uh, we, we still see this to some extent in this country. Uh, but one of the moves that has accompanied the growth of government in the United States is the progressive weakening of federalism. And I hold no brief for state governments. State and local governments can also be quite tyrannical. Uh, but the beauty of having a lot of uh, these little tyrannies is that we can run away from them. And to some extent, that puts pressure on them to lighten up on their tyrannical actions. So it's imperative that we not move to a single government that embraces everybody. This would be the worst, most horrifying fate for humanity. Alpine, California, you're on with Robert Higgs. Please go ahead. Hi, Robert Higgs. Thank you so much for taking my call. I once was on uh, welfare, and my father basically embarrassed me enough that I got off welfare and am making it in the world. I've worked for state governments and federal governments, and I work for the uh, what you call the economic capitalism group now, and free markets. But my husband has, it would love to hear from you. He's on the road today, and he has one question. I told him about you on the air, and he said, how do we stop this? Do we need to start and do another revolution? Uh, how do we stop this uh, is, is a seemingly simple question. Uh, if I had a simple answer, I would give it to you straight away. Uh, this is a, a situation that developed uh, over a long period of time, uh, more than a century, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's the product of a complex historical process. It didn't come into being uh, in a simple way, and there's no simple way uh, to remedy uh, the evils that we find ourselves immersed in today as a result of having big, overbearing, tyrannical or quasi-tyrannical government. But I do believe that the first step that has to be taken is, is to increase public understanding of the situation in which we find ourselves, how we got here, and uh, what measures might be taken to move us in the opposite direction. Uh, at present, we are moving further toward big, abusive, expensive, unaffordable, overbearing government. And we're doing this not simply here, but we're doing this uh, on, on a very wide international scale, as we've just seen with the G20 meeting uh, that concluded recently. Uh, the governments are attempting to cartelize. They call it cooperation. Uh, they paint a pretty face on it. But every time they take these measures, uh, they remove another refuge for people who are attempting to escape from tyranny. And uh, what we can do is uh, try to improve our own understanding of how the world works and then support measures uh, to, to rescind, to appeal, to cut back, to go in the opposite direction. And we'll always be told that we can't go in the opposite direction, that we can't turn the clock back. But we can turn the clock back. Tyranny was worse under Stalin than it is in Russia today. They turned the clock back. Tyranny was worse in Germany under Hitler than it is in Germany today. They turned the clock back. We can turn the clock back too, but we have to have a commitment to do so. We have to have enough people who understand why the world is in the shape it's in, how it got there, and what measures will get it out of that situation. Until we have wider public understanding, our quest is really hopeless because people will always be taken in by propaganda and by the arguments of people who hope to use government power in the service of their own interest group objectives. Sure, they think, well, if I don't use this power, uh, somebody else is going to grab it and use it for purposes that hurt me. So I'd better grab it before somebody else does. This never works. In the long run, it only increases the growth of government power until we find that there's really only one effective government uh, interest group left standing at the end of the day, and that's the government itself. Uh, we've seen this happen in other places. We can't say, 
it can happen here, it can happen here, and unfortunately, it has to substantial extent already happened here. Has there been a time in American history where we have rolled back, as you say? Yes, uh, the early 19th century saw considerable rollbacks, and uh, there, there were also uh, short-term rollbacks after some of the major wars. After the Civil War, there was considerable rollback of government power, uh, and, and government didn't grow very fast for the next 30 or 40 years, although it began to accelerate in the late 19th and early 20th century. But uh, certainly some aspects that, uh, that were most uh, horrifying, such as slavery, uh, were abolished. Uh, so uh, to, to think that, that uh, we're caught in, uh, in some kind of wheel of history that can only roll in one direction is a great mistake. Uh, that wheel can, can be rolled in any direction that we choose to move it. But we can't move it as single individuals. We have to have more people who understand uh, the wheel, what it's crushing underneath its weight, and how to turn it back. Jamaica, New York. Um, earlier on the show, you were very unhappy with government programs, um, bailouts, etc. cetera. Uh, you're willing to let uh, corporations, corporations go their own way. And generally speaking, the government believes that it's just going to exacerbate the problem. Fewer jobs, fewer purchases. If they don't do anything, what's the economic mechanism that's going to reverse the situation, that's going to right the economic ship? Thank you. Uh, if the government would remove itself from uh, these uh, bailouts and uh, stimulus packages and, and all the rest of it, and let market forces operate, what we would see is that firms that have become insolvent would have to go through bankruptcy proceedings. Their valuable assets would be reallocated to other holders, and those holders would manage them, we hope, in a more intelligent and responsible way, this time around learning that they had better do due diligence if they don't want to preside over a new bankruptcy down the line. Uh, what we're, we're doing now is creating uh, what uh, economists call moral hazard. Uh, we're, we're teaching people the lesson that if they take a big risk and it works out, they will profit highly. But if they take a big risk and it doesn't work out, then the taxpayers will bail them out. Uh, this is a very one-sided uh, uh, incentive that is created for people. It creates an uh, incentive for people to undertake uh, projects, and measures that they would never undertake if they had to fear the consequences of being themselves responsible for failure down the line. So if we did nothing, there would be a lot of rearrangements because during the boom uh, that was brought about by a variety of government measures, including a very easy money policy by the Federal Reserve System earlier in this decade, uh, a lot of resources were put into projects that are not sustainable in the free market. They're sustainable only if eventually propped up or bailed out by the taxpayers. And that's what's happening now. Uh, but it's not the case that the incumbents in today's market, the people who now operate firms or enterprises or projects, uh, are, are the ones that, that ought to be kept going. Uh, the market system is a system that continually reallocates control of resources. Those people who please consumers and make profits gain control over more resources. People want to invest in those companies. People want to work for them. Uh, those companies that do not please consumers, uh, that are badly managed, that do not control their costs, those people get into trouble and go bankrupt, and the assets are taken away from their control, and they pass into other hands that, that will manage them more effectively. This is the market system. It's a dynamic system. It's a system for allocating and continually reallocating the economy's resources. That's why we're rich today. If we tried to prop up the economy of 1800 or 1900, we would be as poor as our forebears were. But because we allowed markets to work, 
so that they, they were able to reallocate resources, so that people were in a position to go bankrupt, had to take responsibility for their own bankruptcy. We had economic progress in this country. If we, if we remove those responsibilities, then we're going to end up in a situation <laughs> of economic stasis. The dynamism will be crushed out of the system because we've created a system uh, that will not uh, behave itself uh, subject to competition and individual responsibility. And finally, in 30 seconds or less, John Singleton of Denver, Colorado wants to know, in your view, who is the greatest economist of the 20th century? Uh, in my view, Ludwig von Mises was uh, far and away the greatest economist of the 20th century. Uh, besides Mises' own work, uh, which I highly recommend, uh, all of it's still very much alive, although it goes back almost a century. There's a wonderful biography by uh, Guido Hussmann uh, called Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism, and uh, that's a great book, and I highly recommend uh, Hussmann's book. Robert Higgs has been our guest here on In-Depth for the last three hours. Now, we've barely scratched the surface. We haven't even had a chance to look at some of the, the uh, books that you've edited and what they're about. But very quickly, if you want to know more about Robert Higgs, go to independent.org. That is the website of the Independent Institute, of which he edits this journal, the Independent Review, right here on top of the pile. And very briefly, here are his, some of his books, Against Leviathan, Government, Power, and a Free Society, Neither Liberty Nor Safety, Fear, Ideology, and the Growth of Government, Crisis and Leviathan, Critical Episodes in the Growth of American Government, Depression, War, and Cold War, Studies in Political Economy, and Resurgence of the Warfare State, the Crisis Since 9-11. Robert Higgs, thank you for being on Book TV's In Depth. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. And our website, booktv.org, you can find out the schedule and when this will be re-airing, and you'll be able to watch it online also. Thanks for being with us.